Kyle Matrulis has been called the world's leading authority on open source teledildonics. He has worked on a, as both designer and reverse engineer on a wide range of interactive technologies, including sex toys, erotic furniture, public health devices, self-driving cars, electro-stimulation systems, and biometric monitors. Machulis is the founder of buttplug.io, a project to design, develop, and promote open source standards and software libraries for the control of intimate hardware. Kyle has presented extensively in workshops and lectures at venues including Ars Electronica, Quantified Self Conference, South by Southwest, GDC, Sig Chi, Vienna Art Week, and the University of Applied Sciences, Graz. His work has been featured in periodicals including Wired, Gizmodo, Motherboard, Make Magazine, Vice, Fast Company, New Scientist, and the MIT Tech Review. He has held creative residencies at Autodesk Pier 9 Technology Center, and the Museum Courtier Vienna, and is the recipient of the Robotic Exotica Interaction Design Award and the Ars Electronica Golden Clean Award. Please join me in having a well, warm welcome to Kyle Machulis. Hey everybody. Um, so let's get this thing started because I've got a hundred slides and an hour to go. Um, so first off, the big question, who am I? Um, I am first off an engineer. Uh, I've worked in robotics and video games and self-driving cars. These days I actually work on the Firefox web browser, so if it's breaking for any of you, I'm sorry, it's my fault. Um, I'm also an artist uh, that has worked in all sorts of mediums like uh, sound art, robotics, video games, but the thing that most everyone knows me for is teledildonics. And the thing about this word is I've found, I mean, I've been presenting on this for 14 years now, and every single talk that I give, at least someone has not heard this word. So I like getting this out of the way at the beginning of the talk because it also kind of wakes everyone up. Let's all say it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Teledildonics. Thank you. Isn't it your favorite word ever now? Um, so, in terms of what I do in Teledildonics, uh, I run a website called MetaFetish. Uh, it uh, has been around since 2004. Uh, I cover sex and technology news and um, how hardware works, DIY projects, art projects, really whatever I can think of that ties into the world of sex and technology. And now in 2017, so a couple of years ago now, uh, I started the Butt Plug Project. Um, Butt Plug is... Uh, as Jeep said, a open source standards and software project for controlling intimate hardware, including sex toys, fucking machines, electrostimulation hardware, and more. And believe me, that more gets pretty crazy when it's coming at the end of that list. Um, now, in terms of what I really do as an artist, though, I consider my medium to be interactive haptics and touch and the specific niche within that intimate haptics and touch. And really what I'm looking to do is enable new haptic experiences and provide tools for other people that want to make new haptic experiences. This is not just my world. I'm not the only person that can feel touch. I would like everyone to be able to explore this realm as much as the audio or visual or smell or taste. And that's really my goal. Now, in terms of making the butt plug project, uh, we actually have a mission statement. Uh, the mission statement is, and I will just read it verbosely because I haven't memorized it yet. Um, butt plug is committed to the safety, autonomy, and human rights of people using it as a sex technology standard and stands in solidarity with the many intersectional rights of individuals to be sex positive. As such, butt plug encourages individual empowerment through self-directed education and responsible behavior which is also which are also respective of the needs and choices available to everyone. And a good bit of this presentation is going to be unpacking that statement into actual examples. So first off, let's start with some terms because you may not have heard everything that I'm going to be covering here. Most people have heard of dildos though. Um, now humans have always been a species that has had an interest in sexuality because we're still here. Um, so 
these uh, the dildos that are in this image are actually thirty thousand years old, and I mean maybe it was thirty thousand years old, but and before that, who knows what we did? But I feel like thirty thousand years, I can just call always and be okay with it. Um, now, of course, technology has moved on from there. We can now three D print our molds and create all sorts of new and interesting devices. And even in the past decade, things have really changed where we have companies like Bad Dragon making all sorts of fantasy toys in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and I do mean all sorts of sizes. Um, and even companies that are more mainstream, like Fleshlight, the um, alien down there, that is actually a f alien Fleshlight. So that's a company that's considered to be kind of the most mainstream, and yet they can still make new and interesting forms that are considered to be okay without getting taken off the market or something like that. So moving on to technology. Now, a lot of people have seen vibrators of the past, and these things look pretty scary, honestly. Um, and they're even worse when you see them in real life. If you go to something like um, the Center for Sex and... Um, Sex and culture in San Francisco, they have tons of these, and they're all scary. Um, but there has been this kind of progressive narrative, or uh, progressing narrative, that, oh, they were used by women for hi treating hysteria and whatnot. And one of the interesting parts of this is we don't even have this history completely correct yet. There's been some work uh, lately by Dr. Halle Lieberman on the history of sex toys and how sex toys work within culture. And she actually just published a paper at the end of last year uh, debunking and giving some counterexamples to the myth that vibrators were just used for hysteria and just used for women and brings up examples of them being used in the late 19th and early 20th century on both men and women. So we are still reforming and figuring out our history of these things. Even though mass media has come along and made movies and plays and everything else about how vibrators were for women only and whatnot, it's actually a far more integrated and diverse history than we think, and we're still finding that out. Now, um, there are the vibrators of the present, and of course, these are kind of the plastic baseball bats that we've all seen, or th like these horribly phallocentric devices that cost pennies to make these days and yet can still be sold for tens, if not hundreds, of dollars because we're all scared of anyone knowing that we're buying something that looks like genitalia, therefore we'll pay extra for it. Um, luckily, we're sort of moving out of those forms these days and looking at more ergonomic forms and forms that may not look like an alien or a fantasy and may not look like an actual piece of human genitalia, but still work with our body pretty well. And with that also comes computer control. And now we land in where I work. So... With computer control, we've been thinking about this for decades. Um, Ted Nelson came up with the term dildonics in 1976 as part of uh, computer liberation. And Howard Rheingold's uh, essay first coining the term teledildonics, which all of you are now aware of, um, came out in 1989. So we're 30 years out from the coining of teledildonics. And we kind of continue to move at a glacial pace um, from what the early imagining of these devices were. We are not that far down the line from what was originally proposed. And like all of these are computer controlled vibrators, which I'll talk more about in a bit. Uh, but all they do is control speed from a computer and we haven't really made it as far as I think we could with these. So moving off of the um, vibrotactile paradigm to other ways of movement and stimulation, uh, we have milking and stroking devices like the um, Venus 2000 and the Fleshlight Launch. The Venus 2000 is actually a vacuum device that um, and it, it, it like I wish I had sound here. It is insanely, insanely loud, um, and it, and it makes this. 
My problem is I, I, I'm, I'm wearing a noise shirt. I love industrial music. So I'm just like, yeah, that, that makes, it sounds like there's gears in that thing. That's awesome. Most people don't want that, uh, especially with the region that goes in. Um, but it's still an interesting haptic paradigm to use. Um, and then there's the Fleshlight Launch, which has been one of the most popular sex toys in the past few years. I've actually got one up here so that people can check it out after the talk. Um, it replaces... Uh, it replaces the, jar, the job your arm does with a robot. Uh, so it moves the flashlight for you. That is it. Um, but it is controllable via Bluetooth, and so it is basically a rudimentary form of a sex robot. Um, there are fucking machines. Uh, fucking machines are, exist in sort of this weird area where you need to build them to be large enough to push back against the human, uh, like the human musculature and the pelvis, it turns out our pelvises are really strong. Um, so you need a decent motor to go along with it. And um, the one I'm showing here is, uh, this is an early version of the open fuck, which is an open source fucking machine we're working on. Um, so this, and I, this thing is, the technology behind it's amazing. You you can get sub millimeter accuracy or sub centimeter accuracy in your movements and whatnot. Not that you're gonna be able to notice, um, but there's also I mean fucking machines come as both um, toys that I mean they, they are hardware that needs to be large because we need to have motors in them, and then there are ones that are just purposefully large, which you might have seen on websites like fuckingmachines.com because fucking machines are also an aesthetic. Uh, having a loud, big machine shows power. And showing someone using that machine, it, it's supposed to be larger and more powerful than them, and it actually displays a power dynamic. It, they don't usually need to be that big and loud. So there are reasons that they are built that way. Uh, we can, uh, then there is electrostimulation. So you may have heard of TENS units, which are ways for, which are medical devices uh, used for muscle relaxation and whatnot. This is basically a TENS unit for sex. Uh, there are special um, signals that they have in them that allow you to stimulate um, erogenous zones of the body in ways that are either pleasurable or painful. Um, you may have also seen artists already using these. Stellark, Daito Manabe, quite a few artists have used um, electrostimulation in the past for multiple reasons. And to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, this person actually has electrodes on their face. And due to the fact that we all work through an electricity, we are basically a walking system, uh, electrical system, we can manipulate parts of our body with that. So this person's making facial ge gestures, but you can actually manipulate genitalia or other, um, other body parts that way. So now that we've gone through some of the different modalities of these toys and a little bit of the history, uh, I can talk about the current popular contexts of use, of which there are not many. So first off, we have camming. And you're probably gonna notice here that the, um, the model is blurred out. It is actually considered bad etiquette to take pictures of cam models and cam model interfaces because this is their job, this is their labor, and that would be stealing that. So I have um, blurred out the cam model. But what, would, what normally happens in this interface, this would be the interface that a user sees and interacts with a cam model with. That cam model may have one of those sex toys that I showed in the um, vibration page earlier. And that toy can be controlled by a client paying the model. So the client will have a certain amount of tokens that they can give to the model, and as they give more tokens, the toy goes faster. That is uh, probably the most popular paradigm for teledildonics these days and where you'll see it used the most. Um, outside of that, um, there is just general teledildonics, which is not all that interesting, honestly. You give someone some hardware and a Skype interface and they can control each other. And that's it. And it, it, there is this assumed freedom of UI where it's like, well, they can see each other and they can talk to each other and they've got the toy. They're good. Have you ever tried to use your cell phone to keep your camera on you while also using a sex toy and making sure like the sex toy stays 
on and your network still works and everything else? No. Now, one of the things you're probably going to notice missing from this presentation is uh, sex robots. I don't talk about sex robots because I don't really believe they exist. <laughs> um, there has been a lot of media about them, though, and uh, if you are interested in sex robots, and I shouldn't say they don't exist. There are companies like um, Realbotics that are putting out things that are vaguely technically interesting, but no, we're not getting Jude Law from AI anytime soon. Um, however, I am not the expert on this. The expert is Dr. Kate Devlin. Uh, she wrote a book called Turned On that came out last year. Fantastic book. Uh, and I highly recommend checking that out if you'd like a reference for that. So what do we consider the goal of all of this hardware? Well, obviously, it's to get the consumer off, right? Okay, well, no one booed, which is good. I, I well, Actually, I don't know if that's good or not. That might be bad. Um, because that's kind of a weird way to look at sex, isn't it? To get the consumer off. Now, there has been actually some critical writing on this. Um, Dave Parisi in um, Archaeologies of Touch uh, had a most of a chapter on this device here, which was or, um, part of a chapter on this device here, which uh, is called the Real Touch. This was a toy that was put out for men between 2009 and 2012 or 13. Very, very popular toy. And um, he wrote a, a, a history and sort of a media archeology span of teledildonics and remote touch. And he had some really, really astute things to say about um, the development of the real touch and its impact on society. And I'm just going to, once again, quote him here verbatim in his summary of uh, the analysis of the real touch. Above all, the real touch represented the absorption of teledildonics into a system of capitalist exploitation and value extraction. In spite of its techn technical sophistication, the device ultimately functioned as an economic machine, one that generated value for the company that produced it through the labor of the coders and cam workers tasked with producing the cybersexual reel, while also expressing in the configuration of the technology itself a set of gendered power relations. Cutting through the marketing hype and moral panic, the real touch appears, in retrospect, neither dystopian nor utopian, but instead merely mundane and mechanistic, a one-way masturbation tool that required an immense amount of labor to engineer, enact, and sustain. So I highly recommend his book if you're m interested in talking about the critique of haptics and the history of haptics and ha partially how we got to where I am, like, where I can be giving this talk today. Um, but the, the real answer here is no. It's not to get the customer off. Or, I mean, it is for capitalist companies that are popular today. That's why I'm not working at one of them. Um, what is my goal with sex tech, which is really more of what this talk is about? Um, my goal is to provide the participant with new and or interesting intimate experiences and give them the ability to create these experiences for themselves while staying as out of the way as possible. I don't want people having to think about the technology they use. I really don't want people having to think about my software at all, except if they don't think about it at all, then they're not going to use it. So there's kind of a catch-22 there. But hopefully they can use it, write their own applications, and I can get out of, the, out of their way so they can create their own interesting experiences, and I'm not getting in the way of that. Now... To give you an idea of what it looks like to actually have to design a sex toy, though, let's run through a quick engineering and design review of a toy. Um, sex toy design is really difficult, and I would actually argue that, or sex tech design, I should say. Sex toy design and sex tech design are different. Um, so sex tech design in terms of how do we make these work with computers and other t um, digital interfaces is difficult, and no one, and I would include myself in this, really knows how to do it well. Because we're all up against this. The magic wand. The toy so popular, Hitachi had to spin off a company because Hitachi was known as the magic wand company, even though they make TVs and kitchen appliances and all sorts of other things. They were the magic wand company. Now, the magic wand company is the magic wand company. And that's all they make, and they do just fine. 
Um, but let's look at the Magic Wand. It has a switch with two settings and a plug. We're done. That's it. So now we move on to the modern sex toy with its own app. So if we look at this, okay, so we have, this is the uh, Levin's Hush. So um, you might see, like, I didn't get a great picture of this, but there's a button on the bottom of it that you can kind of see protruding. And then we've got this application where you can put your thumb on your phone, assuming you have a phone that can run the app and talk to the toy. And you can move your, t your thumb around and it will change the speed of the toy. So let's break this down a little bit. When I look at this interface, the first thing that I look at is the mechanical actuation. And that means, what is this toy doing mechanically? This has a vibration motor in it, it's going to vibrate. But I have to look at how many like settings of vibration are there are. Are, is it on and off? Are there a hundred different settings? Because it kind of matters. Sometimes there are hundreds of different settings, which doesn't really matter because you can't tell that much down there. Um, then there's hardware interaction. So how does the user or the participant actually interact with the hardware? Because it might be in a place you can't see. And if you can't see it and you can't tell where the buttons are, you may not be able to turn it off if your phone crashes. That's a problem. Um, installation and system support. When you want to use sex toys, you usually don't want to have to think about which app store you need to go to and all the security that's going to be running in the app and everything else, you just kind of want to use it. So the boot time of these things, of how long, how long from I opened the box for the first time till I'm using it for the first time is there. That is a massive thing that you need to optimize for. Um, the UI. What kind of UI does it have? Is it touch-based? Is it button-based? Am I going to get lube all over my phone when I use it? Um, accessibility. What if I can't use a phone? What if I can't hit the buttons? Is there still a way to use this at all? And a massive portion of the time, the answer to that is no, sadly. Uh, the network. Uh, and for this one, I used a little hotel emoji that I don't know if you can see or not. But what I consider to be the worst environment possible is the place where these are used the most. Hotel Wi-Fi networks. Imagine trying to have sex over a hotel Wi-Fi network. You can't get your email. You can barely get a web page through. You definitely aren't getting Netflix through. And you want to have sex over this. Okay. Uh, so trying to figure out how to deal with network connectivity is so difficult in those terms. Uh, radio communication. So most of these toys are wireless, and um, the toys are, they'll use Bluetooth or something like that. Bluetooth is a radio, and it turns out radios hate meat and water. Guess what we are? So we are putting the radio in meat and water of various shapes and sizes, and it's not very happy about it. This is actually one of the biggest uh, complaints about this sort of hardware is how, how do we make it communicate? <laughs> um, control systems. Is it just one button to move things around or does it actually look like some sort of airplane control panel? I've seen both. Um, and then finally, okay, yeah, startup time I already brought, uh, brought up. Like, when you open that box, how long till you use it? Because usually people get that box and they are super excited. And when I do workshops, um, something I have attendees do is I will just put a box out on the center of the table. And as a group, because I usually do smallish workshops, so like have 10 or 12 people all working together to figure out how to get this one toy in the middle of the table to move around. And it usually takes on a matter of tens of minutes. It's, it's painful for everyone involved. And really, after that, no one's really interested in using it anymore. <laughs> so how do I solve this problem? Well, I have come up with butt plug. Um, butt plug, as has been repeated multiple times now, is an open source standard and software project. So the idea is that you can write 
all sorts of software for all sorts of sex toys using the same library on many different operating systems. And one of the things you might be asking is, hey, Kyle, why did you name it Butt Plug? Because it's going to be kind of a difficult life to sell this, which, well, okay, it's open source. I won't be selling it, but even to give it away, <laughs> it becomes a little difficult. And so there was, uh, there's a few reasons behind this. Um, first off, I mean, I've been working on this for 14 years, or working in sex tech for 14 years, and you get sick of saying, well, okay, sex toy or sex hardware or intimate hardware or fucking machines. And there was a point where I just started calling everything a butt plug. And that's because butt plugs are genderless. So I can mostly vaguely assume everyone has a butt of some kind. Um, uh, it's funny. It kind of breaks up the sort of iciness of just randomly talking about sex toys, which I don't do, but people I know will talk, come in and talk to me about, and then I have to include other people in the conversation that might not have known that. And that's a really interesting conversational gambit right there. Um, it's subversive. And by that, I mean I, I distribute this as um, open source software that anyone can download and use. And it's built a community um, around itself. So there are all of these heteronormative forums of butt plug users. And I've, so I've changed all of these um, forums that are talking about maybe sort of um, – that are mostly um, cishet males that may be talking about porn and stuff. Now they're all talking about butt plug. So whenever a new user comes in and there's all these guys talking about butt plug, they're like, what? So, uh, so, so there was a, a bit of an intervention there that was just kind of fun to watch happen. And finally, it brings a little bit of filth into technology, which now more than ever is a really big problem. Um, Every bit of tech is so sterilized that there is almost a lack of humanity to it. And getting this on the App Store is going to be a problem. I've actually had to come up with different brands for different software because I can't just, I mean, this is a library anyways. It wouldn't go on an App Store. But if I called an application butt plug, it's not going to show up on an App Store. Uh, it's not going to show up on the iPhone. I would, I might be able to get it on an Android, but it would be a fight. Um, and so it's trying to break down this sterility of tech and add a little bit of humanity back in via our own filthiness. So what does interaction with this look like? Well, um, so let's say you create an application that has a slider to change controls or to change speed of a toy. Usually when you download something for a... Um, when you download something for a toy you just bought, it's only going to control that toy. That's it, period, the end. What my, what my software does is you can connect your client application to my software, and then suddenly you can connect to that toy, or this toy, or this toy, or this toy, or this toy, or a gamepad, because this is the vibrator most people have. Um, or even, as long as it vibrates, we don't care. Um, and yes, there are Bluetooth toothbrushes out there. None of them I can actually control vibration through yet, but I am waiting for the day and I know it is coming. <laughs> um, so what do we think an open source solution fixes here? Why, why do this? Well, you can do whatever you want with what you buy finally, assuming you have the correct programming skills, proper hardware, and development environment. Yeah, I really hope there. But the nice thing is there's a community. So the com if you don't have those programming skills, or if you have one piece of hardware, but another person has another piece of hardware you can't afford yet, but you're planning on getting it at some point, assuming, and we have ways of keeping people anonymous and whatnot too, so they can work together, there is a community that you can work with. We're looking to provide a new landscape. Really, everything has been commercially driven so far. So if there is a type of hardware or a type of content that is not going to work commercially, it doesn't really exist. And we are hoping to open up that so that anyone can create whatever they want. Um, preservation and distribution of software. So I'm not the first person to have come up with se uh, sex software. But a lot of it has been lost to the ages because people are not really wanting to be known as sex software authors. I'm kind of alone in that. 
Um, but there's been all of this interesting software that's come out. Uh, and interestingly enough, just a side note for um, those of you that are, that are programmers, a lot of the software is written in Visual Basic or Java because most sex software writers are enterprise programmers that take their skills home and implement their own software with it, which is a really interesting sort of software ethnography thing I've picked up. Um, but none of these people want to be known. They'll post it to a forum somewhere, and then the software will die. And the problem is there are a lot of people that get really hooked on these pieces of software. And we would like, to, we would like them to last longer. So one of the goals of the project is not only setting up so, uh, code and libraries for this sort of thing, but uh, setting up methods and strategies to continue the software, to teach people how to do things in open source and still be anonymous if they want. Um, preservation of devices. So every device on this screen is dead. It's no longer sold. And much like that software, people find hardware that they love and they never want to let it go. Like especially with the real touch there, that stopped selling in 2013 due to an IP lawsuit. They are still for sale today and sell for over $1,500 used. They're a popular machine, no matter what way you cut it. And at some point, we'll be able to 3D print that. We can reverse engineer that. But until then, we want to at least keep it running. And the software that I build like, can make it work with VR and whatnot. So we want people to be able to use what they are comfortable with. And we don't want either the good or the bad technology lost to the ages because we can learn from it when we are creating new things. So what problems does this solution cause? Well, first off, um, maybe I was a little bit in too engineer about that because let's go back and look at that slide where I was like, what does an open source solution fix? Um, you know, I mean, the usage of the word solution there, is, is there a solution for sex? I mean, like, really, as much as, like, with Girdle and mathematics, I think people would definitely have some things to say about the completeness for a solution of sex. Um, and then, <laughs> what does the solution fix? That's some incredibly masculine, ableist language there to imply that I can fix sex. No, no, we can't. <laughs> and that's why this platform is an experiment. It is made to be sort of a safe space to work inside. And so really what I have to constantly do with this project is consider and change my wording as an engineer back to a human. Um, and so I would change that slide to what does an open source strategy facilitate? Because coming in with an engineering term like open source strategy, we kind of refer to a, we can refer to it like as a strategy to facilitate interactions versus this problem that needs to be solved, which is what Silicon Valley loves to do. And if we use this term of open source, what does an open source strategy facilitate, then Silicon Valley is allowed to go fuck itself with, with whatever definition it wants. Uh, so, going on, um, what, what is this technology, do we even need this? D no one really asked, it was just like, well, we're gonna fuck computers, yay! <laughs> and, and we've seen where that kind of techno-optimism gets us now, haven't we? So, it's a valid question, but it's kind of a difficult one to ask, because if I say no, then I might as well pack up and leave. Uh, but... Um, I mean, the, part of me kind of works with the idea that we may or may not need this, and I may actually find out that, no, this was all just a bad idea. Um, and it could be that I also find out that it was a good idea. Um, but I've got to keep a constant critique going there. And I will, not, I, I will not lie. There's part of me that works from a sense of panic, where if we don't take what has been given and apply it to ourselves and queer it up if we need to and everything else, we're not gonna have a choice at some point. And so I wanna get it out there and I wanna get it in the hands of people as soon as possible. 
So, and a little bit of a diagram on this here. This image in this um, slide is from a sex toy from 2006 called the Zhizhou. This was a full-on programming language for sex toys. Uh, or for a specific sex toy where you could like drag these squares in. And it was made by Soda Design, who are a fantastic design firm. The toy failed within three months because they learned no one wants to program their sex toy. So I am fighting an uphill battle here. Um, the next question is, what or is there such a thing as not safe for work code? Because most coding sites don't really think about is this code filthy or is this code age restricted or anything else? It's instructions for a computer and they kind of forget that you're the person that's giving the instruction to the computer is a human. Uh, and I've found this out multiple times when I like start uploading butt plug code to some sort of open source site and suddenly either my, I, I, I've actually had to work with a few services to implement um, search delisting because I would upload something that's open source and all of a sudden I would like appear in like this database code or whatever else too. And people would be like, why is that there? Is someone trolling the system? And it's like, no, it's actual code, but there, engineering is not really equipped to deal with the humanity of this code. Finally, um, how do you even regulate technology like this? Can you regulate technology like this? And th there's multiple issues with this where, first off, there's content. Uh, later I'll be showing a movie synchronization interface that can be used to synchronize sex toys with movies. Imagine applying that to literally any YouTube video you could. And this is not a speculative problem. We've already seen deep fakes, which was a way of using machine learning to overlay anyone's face onto the face of a porn model to make it look like anyone was in that porn. This is not an if, this isn't even a when, this is the past, and now we have to deal with it. And I have to deal with it within releasing my software because it is something that I could possibly enable. Uh, and also there's safety. We want people to be safe. We want people to do things in a safe way. We put that in our mission statement. But we do have to worry about unsafe practices. There are, um, for instance, the thing at the top up there is known as a vacuum bed or a vac bed. Um, people have built um, interfaces for vac, be vac beds to solo vac bed with no one else around and have died due to suffocation. Um, it's, there are safe ways of doing a lot of edge play and other things, but people trust technology. They're like, well, this person looks like the, they knew what they were doing when they wrote this code. And they don't have me standing there going, no, I didn't know your computer. I didn't know what operating system you were running. I didn't know what else you were running with the software. This is not real time guaranteed medical software running on a specific piece of hardware. This is whatever you installed it on. And I have to figure out how to communicate that to people while they are super excited to have sex with my software. That is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And what does sex tech consent and a privacy model for this stuff look like? Because we have this problem with a lot of connection mechanisms where um, there's security issues. Um, so there's this thing called screw driving, which is not actually a hack. It is just a way these toys work. Uh, Golan, can you hand me that one, actually? I just realized I can use this now. Okay, so assuming this turns on, which, please turn on, please turn on, please turn on. It turned on. Okay, so as you can see, this is running, and it's on, and everything, and now I'll turn it off. Um, Don't worry, I washed it. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's it's new out of the box. Um, <laughs> but um, that toy is on and sitting there right now, and if any of you were to turn on your phones and do a Bluetooth scan, you could see it. And if you had the Lovins app, which some of you may be running to download right now for all I know, you could sit there and control it. There is no security. So as long as you are within Bluetooth range of the toy and someone else is not hooked up to it, and that's just kind of the way manufacturers do things, it's a problem. I mean, it's not a, a huge problem because you, I mean, 
there's not usually people wandering around on the street that have deep knowledge of Bluetooth and scanning and devices and everything else that are going to find this, but it is a problem and it's going to make people feel uncomfortable. If they feel uncomfortable, they will never approach this kind of hardware. Uh, luckily, there are people that are working on this. Uh, Sarah Jamie Lewis is a fantastic privacy and security researcher who's uh, worked on a platform called Onion Doldonics. Um, this was a way of doing metadata proofed um, communication for sex toys. And what that means is not only does the person that's controlling your toy not know who you are, not know what toy you have, you may not know who they are or what toy they have, the every hop in between does not know. Not even the server knows. So it keeps complete privacy in, um, across all levels of the system. Uh, and she's done a lot of work specifically in queer privacy. She wrote a book called Queer Privacy that a lot of um, what she does and what her, um, uh, her organization, Open Privacy, which the URL is right there, um, does is taken from the queer lived experience of others to create these systems. Uh, and then there is Renderman, who runs the Internet of Dongs project. Uh, funny name, important project. Uh, he works with uh, commercial companies to figure out what are good systems to implement for security so that users don't lose information, so that people aren't blackmailed with things, or that someone doesn't try to usurp control of their toys. Uh, and he sets up security best, best practices uh, with these companies, because most companies that build sex toys are not not super experienced in either sex or tech. That's as bad as it sounds. So there's a lot of us that are having to come in from these communities and kind of educate them because otherwise there's many, many, many worst case scenarios. So now let's actually talk a, a little bit about application instead of theory. Um, so how these toys are controlled. This is a lot of where my work happens. Um, first, we'll talk about movie sync. Um, so synchronizing uh, sex toys with movies has been going on since 1998 at least. That's the earliest I know of. This is the Safe Sex Plus. It didn't connect with USB because USB barely existed. It didn't connect with serial. It connected by sticking a little sticky box on your monitor that had a photodiode in it. And so what that means is you put this little window up and it would change colors from black to white that would synchronize with a movie. So the lighter it got, the faster the toy would go. And the darker it got, the slower the toy would go. Hacky, it worked. Um, it was actually used as one of the original um, webcam teledildonics interfaces in 1998. John Halcyon Sten was doing live camming at the time and actually had sex online with some of the viewers uh, using this interface. Um, so here's what modern um, movie sync looks like. Um, this is actually run in a completely in a browser. I, I wrote this player. Uh, it's called Sinky Dink. Uh, <laughs> and so it's a little choppy because OBS was not happy when I took this video. It, real, it will run at 60 FPS. But what's going on there is, so there's the movie. On the bottom is a mapping of a file that we have matched that movie. And then you can see up in the simulator panel there, if we had like the flashlight launch hooked up to it, that's how it would be moving the flashlight light. So we can talk a little bit about the production mechanism for this because that's also, it's free, it's not open source. Um, I don't believe that's for any specific reason other than the author didn't want to deal with open source, which understandable, but you can still download this for free. Um, this is called Joy Fun Scripter. It is an amazing program um, that allows you to um, basically make the mapping files to go along with the movie. And it has many, many interfaces to do that that are really interesting. Um, I'm doing it with a mouse. And unfortunately, on the machine that I was uh, using for this, I only had nipple-related porn. Um, so this is someone that's actually twisting someone's nipples. Um, and the interface was not made to encode that, but it worked as a demo. Um, so talking about some of the, like I was using a mouse there, that's a horrible interface, but the things the community have come up with, oh my God, this is, okay, sorry. Um, there we go. Um, so this is my favorite one. It's not the most efficient one, but it's my favorite one. Um, 
So this is um, what, what they called the string method. So you would tie one end of a string to a flashlight and the other end to a joystick. And you would use that to move things along with the, um, uh, with the motion. So basically, you would masturbate to the motion of the movie, and it would use the joystick as a sensor to encode that. Now, since then, they've gotten um, technology together where you can just basically duct tape a Vive VR sensor to a flashlight, and it will track that, and that is far, far better for what it is. Um, but one of, the, I, one of the things that I find super interesting about this interface is that it's kind of a method of accidental queering in that if we were just, like when I had my mouse up there, all I was doing was moving my mouse, right? Um, but it's actually mapping the um, motion on screen. Now, this, use, this method uses an actual masturbation session and people are sharing their masturbation sessions with each other. So it's like, are you, are you actually recording the motion of the movie or are you recording the motion of your masturbation? And if I play that back on me, am I playing the movie on me or am I playing your masturbation on me? There's all of these really amazing questions that come out of these um, community-centric solutions that haven't really been addressed and answered yet and they're just taken as the most useful and quick way to do things. So, it's, and, this, and stuff like this pops up all over the place. Um, we can also recontextualize the vibration so it doesn't have, or the stroking, so it doesn't have to be stroking. For instance, here, um, same interface, the same movie interface and everything, except now it's actually hooked to an electrostimulation box. So we can turn that stroking into electrostimulation, which means if you are not compatible with some toy or you just like electrostimulation more or something like that, we can actually recontextualize how the, the movie affects you in a way that will affect you that you want. Um, it makes the media and the methodology more accessible. What I'm really interested in though, and I will warn you, this, um, this slide is going to have flashing lights here in just a second, so if you're susceptible to flashing, you might wanna put your head down for just a sec. Um, I'm super interested in encoding things like abstract art and music videos. Uh, this is Autiker's Gantz Graph video. I desperately want to encode this. Um, it works so well along with the music and everything else, and I'm far more interested in like creating new synesthetic experiences than I am just some porn. Um, and that's the fun part about the software is you can basically use it anywhere. As I said earlier, it's also the scary part. But um, it does work with VR. I couldn't actually find a good VR picture because it's really hard to portray VR in a presentation. Um, so I'm just gonna say it works with VR. Uh, <laughs> um, next up, video games. Uh, so how can we do the, what can we do with video games? So I started by working with video games. My first big sex tech project was a thing called the sex box that I made in 2005. I pulled the force feedback motors out of an uh, Xbox controller and replaced it with wires that went out to a dildo. So that, or a vibrator, the, so that any time a game vibrated, a, um, it would also make the sex toy vibrate. Now, this was a really interesting thing for 2005. Um, it's also, uh, I gave a presentation with it on stage at GDC 2006 where I used um, the game Burnout uh, with this. And the reason I used Burnout, Burnout's a racing game, but usually racing games, you're supposed to get the car in one piece to the finish line. Burnout is make the biggest crash possible on the way there. Like you really wanna fuck stuff up. And so with Burnout driving a sex toy instead of a vibrating gamepad, I created the first video game uh, version of J.G. Ballard's Crash. Um, and then I presented that at GDC 2006, and that is how I got into the game industry. Don't follow those, that advice. 
Um, so the Game Vibration Router is a piece of software that I created in 2017 after I started Buttplug to do that as a software-only solution. So you don't need to modify a controller anymore. Now we can just hook the game, similar to how a game cheat works. Um, so this is a demo of me doing this with the game Rocket League. Rocket League is a game where you're a car with a hat playing soccer. Um, and what you'll see here, I pick up the controller, and anytime you hit the ball or hit boost on the car or score a goal, things vibrate. So it recontextualizes the game into a sexual environment. Instead of the goal being get the most points um, or to score, um, <laughs> Okay, that one took a minute. <laughs> um, it's now, how can I provide pleasure to the player on the other end, because this is an online game, um, through this possibly weird, not all that sexy interface? Though, I, not to kink shame, if people are into cars with hats, um, it, it's, um, it, it, but it's not, the, it's not the easiest interface to have sex with, I will say that. Um, so I actually use this, um, I work a lot with cam models directly because I'm super interested in making, um, making sex work interfaces, especially di digital sex works interfaces, more human. And I find the cam room model to be incredibly inhuman. You just have all of these random names coming through yelling, take your clothes off or turn around or whatever else. Like I can't actually deal with being in a cam room. Um, so I work with, um, one of the models I work with, uh, Riley Scarlett, she's fantastic. She's a psychology student who's actually working on sex work and disability because you'll find out that that um, a lot of uh, cam workers are actually disabled because it allows them to set their own uh, schedule and they can do it from home. It's a fantastic way for some of them to make money and that's really cool and I wanna help that out. Um, so the problem is they're provided these inhuman interfaces by the cam companies that do the streaming and stuff for them. So um, we used the game vibration router here um, to so that she could play Rocket League while actually using a toy uh, with her fan club, which is a set of subscribers um, that get pictures from her and whatnot. And so, and it became this really interesting, fun interface where instead of it was just her on sort of this weird digital pedestal and all of these people yelling at her, it was an actual interactive experience where everyone was having fun, laughing, sometimes forgetting that there was a cam model using a toy um, because they were like, oh, well, I, need, I need to score and I need to move the ball around and stuff. And it's like, do you really? <laughs> um, and there's some problems with this interface too where we um, have issues with people like not understanding it and whatnot because it's a very new thing. But it's something where we've been working on and um, she's been fantastic to work with. Um, another game, and this one's really weird for this, uh, this is called Crimson Land. Uh, it's a top-down shooter where you shoot bugs and zombies and things like that. And not the sexiest thing in the world, except there's 30 guns, which is, okay, also not sexy, but each gun comes with its own vibration pattern. So, I, okay, it's really hard to defend this as a sex interface, but... <laughs> Um, but, okay, but it, recontextuali it recontextualizes play so that you might want to pick up, like, the gun with the most interesting pattern versus the gun that works the best. So what about text, though? We've talked about a lot of audio-visual things, but text um, is not, it's not something people think about other than, like, sexting and whatever else. So um, I work with Twine, which is a... Um, Basically, think of it like an interactive fiction or choose your own adventure game engine for the web. Um, it's really popular for uh, LGBTQIA plus stories and experiences and interactions, as well as just all sorts of other stuff like Horse Master, which is one of my favorites. I definitely say play Horse Master, and I can usually tell in the audience who has played Horse Master when I say that. <laughs> it's amazing. It's not sexy. Um, but then there's other games like... Um, for Those We Love Alive by Porpentine, which is an amazing interaction of text and body. So I went and created a uh, plugin for Twine so that people that can use Twine, who usually aren't like super experienced programmers, can actually integrate haptics and text. Um, not only that, 
I integrated it as my, um, uh, it's, I use it as my tutorial for um, this, the butt plug software itself. So I'm gonna go really, really quick here because I've got four minutes to go through how does it look to actually make an interface out of this? Because I'm super interested in this because I grew up with text role play and furry and other and muds and mucks and BBS door, door games and everything else. So text role play is a huge part of my identity and the thing is it's dying. Um, this is the mud stats website and if like it's really cool because you look at year opened and it's like 1991, 1990. These are virtual worlds that have existed for 30 years and are still going. But there's hundreds of players sometimes. It's a dying, it's a dying realm. And there's a reason for that. There's virtual worlds like Second Life, which I'm partially responsible for because I worked there for a couple of years. I'm that cube. Um, and I also created the first um, uh, sex toy interface for Second Life because once again, when you give people a virtual world where they can be anything and do anything, they will be anything and have sex. Um, but anyways, uh, what I'm really interested in here is Telegram. Uh, Telegram is an IM service um, that has a really amazing sticker base on it. And so this is like me and someone else just having, I was like, please just post some random stickers. I need this for a slide. But there are people that actually do sexual role play completely through stickers, which is a really kind of interesting way to do things. I mean, they, they may or may not own the characters or personas or whatever else in the stickers, which makes it a little odd. But um, so there's some questions there. But otherwise, it creates a media glyph language for sexuality, which is really interesting. So this is what a sticker pack looks like. And this is like the UI for it. This is the one that I've been using in this presentation too. And by the way, if you wanted, it's at this URL right here. Um, and funny enough, I mean, if you can like take this as like the world's most literal translation of Winter, uh, Winterson's uh, semiotics of sex. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, what, uh, what I could do here is if I have a sticker, that sticker on the computer has what we call a UUID, a, un a unique universal identification. So this is like a string that will never exist anywhere else in the universe and it's kind of mathematically proven that it won't. Um, so I know when we get that sticker and we can actually take that information when it's posted in a chat that has a bot in it or something and translate that into a haptic movement or a haptic pattern. And so this is a project I'm working on right now so that people that are role-playing through these sticker interfaces can actually use this to trigger haptic patterns with each other and to have another level of immersion. Because whenever you add an extra sense to an interactive form, you exponentially increase the amount of immersion that happens. So to clear up in the last 30 seconds, um, <laughs> open source sex tech is not just me too. I, there is definitely a community here. Um, for those of you that would like to hop a plane and get to Berlin tomorrow, um, there's going to be the first workshop of the of touchy-feely tech. Uh, this is a really new and cool um, set of workshops by uh, Alice Stewart, who's an artist out of Berlin, uh, on teaching people how to build their own vibrators. And these are like, this is a basic electronics class but it ends in a more human way than, well, the light blinked. Uh, there's Body Interaction, which is by Jacob Cardano, uh, who is uh, also, I believe, out of Germany. Um, this is a little um, ESP8266 board, which is basically like an advanced Arduino that has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, he's made a sex toy board out of it, as well as an app interface. It's all open source, and it costs like 40 bucks. Um, Shibon, oh my God, this, this is the... This is so cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is a project by Sarah Petkus uh, out of Las Vegas. Uh, she is building what she's calling a suit of amour. Not a suit of armor, a suit of amour. Um, she's building different pieces to publicly display her arousal um, based on biometrics and other things. So she's got like a butt winch, which actually kind of like winches her butt cheeks up and stuff. And um, she'll have like nipple propellers and things. And, and it's so it's, it sounds kind of funny right now. Once it's, it's this amazing personal expression of arousal though, because she doesn't know how to explain it, how to portray it in normal ways. So she's built her own. And that is the pinnacle of sex tech to me.
Um, and then finally, there's companies like Commingle, which unfortunately no longer exist because they were sued out of existence during the Teledonics patent that I didn't talk about because it doesn't exist anymore as of August 19th of last year. There was a Teledonics patent that regulated all remote sex toys. It doesn't exist anymore. Yay! Um, so there's uh, the Small Project, which is a way to integrate... Um, uh, motor control into any vibrator that takes a battery. Um, that's on GitHub. There's the Nogasm, which is a um, auto orgasm denial system that uses um, muscle-based biofeedback for stop starting and stopping toys. That's really interesting. All this stuff's open source, and there's a community around it, and more people are showing up every day. So with that, I'm done. <laughs>